Hi, my name is Anya. I'll be your chair for this one. I go by she, her, or they, them pronouns. Um, I'll give the panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Yeah, I'm Blake. Um, I'll be your judge. And I do like the flow. <laughs> I'm Jessica, she, her, and I'm still one of your judges. Cool. Um, so I'm going to go around and get who's speaking first and who's speaking second from each team. At that point, if you'd like to offer preferred pronouns, happy to make a note of it. Otherwise, I will default to your speaker title. Okay, so in opening government, who's speaking first? Richard B. He, him, pronouns. And speaking second? Sophia, she, her, or like speaker positions. Opening opposition, who's speaking first? Uh, Dylan, neutral's okay. And speaking second? Uh, Ash, they, them are my pronouns. Okay. Closing government, um, who's speaking first? Nicholas, I'm speaking position. Okay. And speaking second? Katie, I'm speaking first. Positions are fine. And in closing opposition, who's speaking first? Robert and John, in that order. No preference on pronouns. So I'll be keeping time. Signals are what you know them to be. Minute one, minute six, minute seven, and at 7.15, I'm gonna be doing this until you stop talking. Cool, so without any further ado, I'd like to call this house to order and invite the Prime Minister to deliver a speech not to exceed seven minutes. You're here. here. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan are surrounded by wolves on all sides. This round is going to be about how the people in those nations can best preserve themselves, their culture, and their welfare. As we delve into this, I will first provide some definitions and a model, then I'll be moving on to two points of positive matter. First is defense, second is economic. So first, this house is people living in the four named nations, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Um, the interests of are going to be providing for the people's needs. It's what they want. They probably don't want to be invaded by someone. Like it's, they want to preserve their own culture, so on, and be able to buy food. Um, Central Asian states are the states outlined in the info slide. It's Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, the model is going to be that people in these nations would support the establishment of this um, organization. So now, moving on to my first point, defense. Right now, they are surrounded on all sides. We have three major powers that are warring for influence over these nations. Those powers are Iran, Russia, and China. Each of them has a history of kind of uh, trying to influence the matters of other nations and trying to gain control and establish like proxies. Um, so all of them are trying to gain influence within these nations, trying to manipulate their cultures, trying to manipulate their government decisions, so on. Um, I think the way this looks and would work if they continued is similar to Xinjiang in Western China. Um, they don't want to be part of China, however, they are subjected by the Chinese government. Um, this is where all the Uyghurs stuff is happening. Um, They're the Chinese government in the trying to spread Han Chinese culture has made being is being a Uyghur a crime. People are put in concentration camps because they are Muslim and have this different culture. This is the way that China and these other nations try to expand their influence, and in many other more subtle ways I will describe later. Um, so, by unifying and establishing this international cooperation, they can bind the militaries together and have joint negotiation tactics. They together would be able to be on the same level as these other nations. They could, they'd have geographically a similar size to Iran, um, and they'd be able to stand up against these threats. Okay, so that would mean that Iran uh, Russia and China wouldn't be able to bully them around with their giant military with all of their influence and they could instead stand together with unity and have a stronger defense. I'll go ahead and take a few on. Yeah, there are many states in this region that would apply to this, but how rich are these states and how big and strong are these militaries realistically? Just in your characterization. Um, right now, these states are pr pretty weak. That's why they need to come together. Um, and the people there don't have as much money. But again, the economic growth that establishing this 
can build will be able to strengthen their military in this unity against the common foes will be able to all cross apply and strengthen this um, it brings this brings me into my second point economic strength so right now people in this area are <coughs> lack access to many resources um, the goods we see as that are easily accessible here in America are a lot harder to obtain there and employment is much harder to get and these the commonalities that would be established in this agreement, including a common currency and free trade between these nations, would strengthen them in the same way it strengthens almost, um, almost anywhere else, and especially here. Having a common currency can allow them to become uh, more united along with free trade. These two would effectively merge all of their economies, and thus um, workers in Kazakhstan could produce goods for it. Um, for a company in Tajikistan, and uh, yeah, so this can help build markets as people are able to, to engage in mutually beneficial trade and we establish ties between them. As this economic growth happens because of increased economic activity, people have jobs, so on, their standard of living would be able to increase, people would have better access to better jobs, to more resources, and so on, and that would also strengthen their government's legitimacy and strengthen their like military strength, and thus make them able to stand up against China, uh, Russia, and Iran. Um, the, here's where it kind of ties in with the defense and economic portions. Um, one of the big ways that that all these countries are trying to gain influence in this region is by building stuff, by using uh, their companies to uh, gain influence there, using economic means, and by them having a free trade agreement amongst themselves, and thus kind of trying to block out these outside influencers, they would be able to uh, generate a more independent domestic economy. I'll go ahead and take a few while. Okay, so if you're a weak, economic, uh, a weak economic nation and you're trying to build like financial capital in your nation, don't you want more foreign direct investment, not just trade amongst other weaker nations? Here, here. They don't want direct investment as insofar as it looks like China has done in the past. As insofar as it says, we are pushing away your culture and the crime to be Islamic and where they are starting to manipulate their government. Currently, China, Iran, and Russia's direct investment in economic means is being used to gain influence rather than just build up their economy. And by like them uniting together, they can have the strength to have the strong independent economy and trade with actors that aren't going to try to try to like be go all um, imperialist on them and try to take their nation. Um, by having this agreement. And uh, they can have a brighter future where they won't be devoured by these wolves they have on, on all sides. Thus, we can clearly see that that is in the vested interest of every person in these nations. But at the very least, the most of them, because it provides them with a brighter future where they don't have war on their doorstep and they aren't sent to a Chinese concentration camp. Thank you. I thank the speaker for those remarks, and I invite the leader of opposition to open the case for the opposition bench. Here, here. likes to be a smaller power that has to get around along with the bigger neighbors next door, but sometimes that is the best option and that is in your best interest. Side government seems to think that we can do this thing where we not only repudiate, Ru repudiate Russia implicitly by making this kind of a union, but also where we don't jump in bed with somebody else and we just say that like we as a, as a, as a couple of small, relatively, re relatively ill-governed, relative, yeah. relatively economically underdeveloped countries will just stand on our own on a hill rather than going to a different big power or something like that. We just don't think you have the math there to make that work. So two points in this speech. First, damaging relations with Russia, which we actually need and are very important. And second, problems with unions in general and in this particular case. 
first a couple, first to just class briefly. Um, so, so they talk about Iran, China, and Russia. They don't really tell us that much about what specific actions any of these countries are doing to are doing to these countries and why we don't like them. We say on on off that we think the relationship with Russia is obviously like the primary axis here, since like there are land borders shared with Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan, and there are and, uh, Kazakhstan, sorry, and there are like and there are like serious economic ties and like long term integration. We think that's the most important relationship this round. Um, second, they talk about better better economy. We say generally speaking, free trade arrangements work because you're getting access to valuable markets that give you something big and different from what you have locally. Not a bunch of countries that have very similar kinds of industries or like similar things to offer each other and don't necessarily have like big comparative advantage over each, over each other. We don't think a bunch of countries that all have GDPs per capita of like less than ten thousand dollars joining up in a trade union is going to offer that much development. So um, we think that we think that getting better trade ties with Russia, better trade ties with China, like any of the above, is like going to do more for your economy um, than just trying to go it alone. So damaging relationship with Russia. So we say that the Russian relationship is really critical for this round, right? This is because the, the relationship between Russia and each of these countries is like pretty significant and long-standing. Like going back to like past ties and, and interpersonal relationships in like the USSR and like the kind of past relationships there. Um, and also just the fact that they're like very economically tied together now, right? Recognize that a huge chunk of the GDPs of many of these countries comes from remittances from workers who go abroad to Russia, right? That is a huge part of like the, of like several of these economies, especially the ones that don't have oil or their own resources, is that they, Russia is a regional economic hub and, work, and, and people who are looking for jobs and opportunities and employment and to provide for their families can go across the border to Russia, do work in Russia, send money home to their families. That is like a serious chunk of the GDP of several of these, of these countries, and that's a pretty tight relationship, and that's a relationship that can very easily snap. So what does Russia see when this happens? Russia under, comes into this situation with the understanding that Russia generally has decent relationships in which it may enjoy somewhat of an upper hand or be the bigger player, but nonetheless where like it has a positive relationship and these countries generally can get along with it and they can do things together. We think that Russia is generally trying to integrate with, integrate with these countries more by like trying to have like ha trying to have more regional trading arrangements, trying to have like develop the customs union. Whether or not we think that's good to join, Russia comes in thinking that Russia is generally in the direction of getting closer to these countries and doing more with them, not being shut out. Okay, so don't we think that Russia's trying to get closer to these countries simply to control them more? Do you think these countries ought to have more agency rather than saying, like, being beholden to Russia because it's the only place they can have jobs? Do you think they ought to start by forming this union? Yeah, so, like, so like as a Canadian, I might love it if I could just, like, go off and, like, have my own proud Canadian economy with, like, no, with no NAFTA and just do our own thing, but, like, we just don't think that's a realistic option. Yes, you necessarily, like, cede some sovereignty in getting closer with other nations around you, but we think attaching to a big power is, like, the best way to have stability and, like, economic development in the long run, and we think that, like, relationship, it's, they haven't they have made clear on their side that this relationship is actually, like, abusive and, like, fundamentally worse than any other counterfactual. Even if, even if you do cede some things, we still think they have to show that, like, there's some other positive future that could be better than this. Um, which we don't think, which we don't think exists. So Russia sees this as an obvious rejection, right? Because when, because Russia thinks it's integrating, it thinks it's going in a positive direction. What it gets is actually gets shut out. What Russia sees is like a pretty obvious rejection here, right? Because it, it, Russia is the elephant in this room right now, right? Russia is the one saying, "Wow, you are joining up, you are teaming up. Who are you teaming up against? You are teaming up against us because you have a problem with us and because something isn't working for you and you don't like us anymore." That is what that is what Russia perceives. So we think this is a pretty ob obvious rejection. We think it's also just directly to counter Russia's interest in the sense that it is like economically disadvantageous to like have other countries get closer and necessarily divert trade away from you and toward each other. Um, but also like there is a military component, right? Recognize as the info slide said, like this involves like foreign policy coordination and like peacekeeping, like actual like common potentially some kind of common military force or military coordination at the very least. Like we think that Russia generally doesn't like when its neighbors Join, as you see with the European Union, Russia generally doesn't like, like when its neighbors team up and pool their resources and also maybe think about getting an army. Like, so we think Russia has obvious reasons to reject this and be very upset. What can Russia do with that? A lot of things, actually. So like, first, most importantly, we say if Russia literally just changes its policies for worker visas, it can fuck the economies of these countries massively, right? Like if Russia just literally decides that like, oh, okay, now we think that like you need a bachelor's degree to come work in Russia, Russia, Russia or, 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 you need to, or you need to fill out these particular requirements that we know nobody in your country can do. They can shut out a huge amount of workers, deport a huge amount of people, and cut off a whole bunch of flows of valuable remittances to these countries that do help keep, that do help keep families, families afloat. So like we think as a regional economic hub, Russia has lots of power to shut, to, to shut this union out and try to start it out and wait it out. 
um, of any kind of valuable economic things. We also say that like Russia has a, has a history of like internally destabilizing countries that do things it doesn't like, right? Russia has skill at like puppeteering and playing off factions against each other and like intervening the way that it did with like the Yanukovych government in Ukraine, where it like where, where it does it does exert influence over powerful people and it does make them do things that it wants. So we think it has more of an incentive to fuck with these countries internally when they're doing something contrary. So we also say that like. I also say that military intervention is a possibility, and the only thing protecting us from military intervention is whether Russia thinks that the marginal benefits are outweighed by the marginal costs, right? Like, Russia has no qualms about militarily intervening as it's done with Crimea, as it's doing in, like, Ukrainian waters right now. Like, we, like, we don't think that Russia is going to have any compunction about doing that if they decide it's, it's their thing. The other problem is that because this is independent, like, nobody will save us, right? Like, nobody cares about these countries, right? Like, China does not want to, like, get involved with this and enter a very relationship with Russia. The U.S. does not care. So, like, we think that's a really risky proposition. Secondly, and my partner will expand on this, we think there's problems with currency unions. We think there's a reason that this is a level of cooperation that you haven't seen anywhere outside of the European Union, right? We think there's a reason. Like, it's hard to trust countries because you necessarily have to give up some sovereignty and, like, pool things together. We think there's never reasons these countries have a hard time trusting each other. Generally speaking, several of these countries are, like, hybrid, regi hybrid regimes that have a lot of authoritarianism and, like, have a lot of here, corruption here. going on, right? And there's, like, there are, and, and, and there's, like, a reason to believe that, like, A, these countries, like, you have limited information because they don't have a free press, and, like, B, you don't, uh, you, they have rivalries internally, and just generally that they might have, like, limited capacity to implement common regulations or to stick to their end of any kind of a deal. So, like, and also, on a final point, they say that this makes the existing governments more legitimate. We don't think, as the people of these countries, it is necessarily clear that, like, making those governments more legitimate is a good thing, right? Like, we think four oligarchs together scheming in a room is more powerful in oppressing the people than one oligarch in a room. So, like, fundamentally, we say that, we say, take some, take, take some water in your mind, compromise, continue to have a positive, stable relationship with Russia. I thank the speaker for those remarks, and I invite the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the case for the opening government. Here, here. speech with two points of refutation, and then I'm going to go into my two points of uh, positive matter, unity, and proxy wars. So first, on this point about immediately damaging relationships with Russia, we do not believe that this is true. That this, okay, this move to uniting doesn't necessarily have to sideline Russia if it's in the interest of these countries. Like, where in, like, where did you get this idea from that you are automatically sidelining Russia when you decide to have a common market, common currency, and like coordinate and better communicate your armies and, and like get better, better manage your resources? That is just makes no sense. You have to do more like work for this. I will happy listen to that. All right. Next, um, on the uh, okay on on this point on basically saying that. Four oligarchs in a room together are worse than one isolated r ruling a country. The thing about economic progress is that that brings eventually democracy. If you have countries that are underdeveloped, it's harder for them to ever reach democracy and like actually stop being oppressed by the people. Like, let me give you an example. Say, like, Chile, right? Chile before Pinochet. Like, thanks to a lot of the like things that this oligarch, like this 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 freaking horrible dictator did, a lot of the reforms that the Chicago boys brought to that country, they could actually become the most economically like advanced country in Latin America and have the best democracy in Latin America at the moment. They don't they, they have like a really good functioning like rule of law. They have uh, a judiciary that is independent. They have elections that are highly independent. They're doing really well, and it happened through a dictator. So yes, we believe that's possible. We believe that is a good, uh, a, a good way of doing it. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this on unity, which includes economic unity. Before I go on to my positive matter, yes. On trade, when A and B reduce the barriers to trading with each other, they necessarily disadvantage C because C has the same barriers as before. Well, that's what 
trade deals are for, but now you have collective bargaining instead of being a poor country, isolated. Now you get more strength when you are like making these deals. You can better use your uh, your economic advantage, like what's the name, a comparative advantage, to better be able to export things to Russia, to China, to Iran, to wherever you want to. You have more power. You get better deals. That brings more economic development, and that could possibly get rid of your beloved oligarchs. Okay. All right. Let's talk about. Proxy war is my first point of positive matter. Why this union is so important? The reason why it's important is because this will bring more communication between these nations. What does this mean? Basically, diplomatic ties will become closer and closer, which means that they will, for example, share intelligence, know what's going on in each other's countries, understand what's going on and what's actually happening like in the borders that they share and the borders that they share with other countries that are outside of the union and knowing what's happening like internally, for example, during elections, how it's going. So if there is like outside interference, they can right away know what's going on instead of being like shut out from each other and not knowing what, what's happening and what, what happens when in the status quo without this union is that basically they become just pawns in proxy wars, just against each other and, and start fighting. And like, let me think. Let me give you an example. So say Yemen is out of, like, it's not part of the African Union, unfortunately. We believe that if they were, it would be less likely that they would be part of this Houthi rebel uh, instigation that, that, and, and then the resulting proxy war that Yemen became and the horrific humanitarian disaster that it became because they would have had more support, like, from like peacekeeping operations from nearby countries. I know that they're not in Africa technically, but they're really close. And like we believe that if they had been part of the African Union, that would not have happened because other countries that don't have interest, like like Saudi Arabia does, like Iran does, they would have been able to like put the spoon in the soup instead of these countries that are like viciously fighting for geopolitical power. Yes. It is your burden to prove how the CAU more effectively has information sharing when a region feels like it's under threat and historically has been. Why can't we just have information sharing of allyship or have other allies that have the infrastructure to collect that back for like NATO? Okay, let's talk about peacekeeping mission. Like, that's literally the point that I've been making. Like, have you not been listening? Like, if you're sharing military one, you're better using your resources instead of like spending on stuff like again and again. Like, for example, Europe, if they do unify their army, like they have a unified EU army, that will mean that they have better, they're better able to manage their resources, which means that they're not spending so much of their GDP on defense and that they're better able to handle things and not have like repeated th things on one side. And also like countries that are better off economically can afford stuff that's expensive like missiles or tanks, etc. on the other side. Okay, let's talk about, uh, lastly, damn it, where is that? Okay. Let's talk about unity and why this is good. And this is again similar to the proxy war, but it's different because this ties to economic advancement of these countries, which ultimately makes them more stable, one, and also makes them makes their people better off, regardless of whether they are under like a, a, an undemocratic regime or whether they actually finally get into democracy. And what do we see here? When, when they get to trade with each other, and let me give you an example here. Let me give you the example of the Mercosur in South America. You have Paraguay, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay trading together. For example, all of these countries are meat producers. They get together and they're better able to basically trade with big companies like Cargill for products and get them for the region instead of just one individual country. They have better trading, like better infrastructure between each country. For example, Parawa is a country that is landlocked. Without the help from Uruguay, uh, sorry, from, I'm from Parawa, from Brazil and Argentina, they cannot get to the freaking ocean. They cannot trade a lot of things as cheaply. They need that cooperation to better be able to trade. This is great. I just, you have to prove that Russia will become very testy if this happens. Otherwise, you should lose this round. Thank you. I think the speaker for the
those remarks, and I invite the Deputy Leader of Opposition to close up the pop-up of this debate. You're here. Russia is a, U uh, is a global hegemon that kind of hates the demise of the USSR. It wishes it was still in power, and we see this to this day, antagonizing the Soviet bloc, antagonizing Ukraine. Ukraine was thinking of joining the EU, and that's why it consolidated the power over the president, right? So, like, Russia has been a hostile actor in this sense for a very long time, and considering how much we rely on them, it is imperative for us to show good faith and remain in their good graces because they have not only power over themselves as an economic and like um, military actor, but also with a lot of other countries in the region that could drag them into like also putting these kinds of like faults on us as the CAU and putting in embargoes and like other kinds of like bureaucratic stops that like end up fucking our economy up. So Russia is an essential actor here and has been proven historically to be antagonistic and something that has been trying to exert force over the region. But like regardless, we think that like we should have a nation to nation relationship here that doesn't actively antagonize them, and I think my partner brought up a pretty good case. But I'm going to engage in some clash in the case that we got out of opening government here. Okay, so we get this like interesting. Okay, I'm going to talk about their point by point. Okay, so we get this point about defense, right, and like preservation. We say that like we have already national sovereignty to do this, and like um, that's good enough, right? We don't necessarily need the CAU because it has all of these other harms. The national sovereignty in itself can be an actor, and also you have the power to align yourself with other forces around, like. The, uh, with different countries don't, that don't have this kind of like historical background, this historical background of also having the one thing in common that was being part of the USSR that says when you get together as that is your uniting force, that is your thing in common, big fuck you to Russia because we're never going to join you, we don't care, and we have more in common to antagonize you than like with each other, right? So like on defense, that's like inherently antagonistic, and if, if, right, like if safety is an issue, first off, it was their group, we're like, burden to prove that like the region is currently under threat of Russia. Imminent danger. And even if it is, which like it's not, they're in good graces right now and like rely on them so they have no reason to antagonize them, right? Like even if align yourself with NATO, a bunch of poor countries with a GDP per capita of like a thousand dollars aren't going to be able to rival you as like Russian military force, right? Second on economics. Right? Um, they said that they like you get a connection here. We say we already do this before. We already trade as these nations because we're already close together. That's fine. You don't need like blank currency and this kind of thing to do that. And then the last one was proxy war. So again, is there proof, like burden to prove that this region is currently under threat? And it isn't necessary, right? And we get this get this interesting point about information sharing. I think that's interesting, right? Because like you can already have information sharing through allyship, um, allyship in the region, and that's a lot more more covert than uniting your military forces when you're literally bordering with Russia, right? That <laughs> implicitly Implicitly says that like if you antagonize me, I have the ability to rival you. It's an implicit threat by showing that you can rival them in military force even if you can't. Yeah. Additionally, like trying to empower each other and like also having this issue in common where these countries are all very corrupt, you're saying, hi, I'll prop up your dictatorship as you Uzbekistan to like Kazakhstan if you prop up mine to consolidate power of these dictators and these oligarchs that never ends up changing and ultimately when we see. We see people who are really poor and have no social mobility or access to change that, right? And like, lastly, it's it's their like economic burden to prove as well, and I think we adequately adequately dealt with this that like Russia and allies are less economically viable and less less comparative advantage than these nations, which have ultimately a lot of the same resources and. You think that ultimately a global access or an access to the market in all of Asia is more important than these few nations. And that access is important because Russia has that power. Okay, so I want to just talk about my partner's case for a bit and get into my constructive, but I'll take your view on it. Okay, so I, what I'm seeing right now is this mm -hmm. alternative from your case that they should join NATO or other countries. How is that any less aggressive towards Russia, the actor that we're so worried about in this debate? I think there's some tension in your case that you should. Cool, talk. it's not because. They're not currently under aggressive antagonistic military threat under Russia. Here. I'm saying if they were and we were facing the obliteration of sovereignty, you have other options that are actually viable. But we're not, and that's our case. Okay, so on to our constructive. So first we get the case out of my partner, um, basically that like this damages relations to Russia. And I think he did this pretty effectively, and the only responses that we get are like 
this doesn't really sideline Russia, and I think he proves that. And we get some point about like Chile, but like we don't see how that's in any way related to like ACAU. I think the most comparative counterfactual example we have of different sovereign nations pulling together, having the same currency, the same kind of like sharing of like resources, open access, and military power is the EU. I think that's the best counterfactual that we have, and the EU, as we've seen, has had a lot of problems, but for in the ways that it succeeded as long as it has, these countries don't have the advantage of what makes the EU good, right? And we see it ultimately worse. Um, so unions keep like this can be very messy, and I think mostly for like economic problems, right? So like when we look at the EU, right, recognize that there's economic disparities between regions, where there's an economic disparity between like a countries like Germany and France, and then you've got the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, who end up relying on these countries. So there's a disparity here. And what does that end up looking like? Right? That ends up looking like individual countries who have different needs, having less sovereignty through their central banks to deal with contractionary or expansionist policy that can adjust to the unique issues that their country is facing, and it ends up falling on the line of like Germany, right? Or other countries like that. But we also see within policy decision making that like countries like Germany, because they're bailing out these countries like Greece, end up having more power in the end and coming up with policies that can ultimately advantage them more than they advantage Greece because they're self-interested, but also they're political actors that like are responsible to their constituents and want to be re-elected, so they do act in their best interest. So what do you see here? When a bunch of countries with very different social economic um, outlooks pool together, you end up with these disparities happening. And you also kind of see this like an OPEC too, right? With like Saudi Arabia consolidating power and acting in their best interest by like not doing a price setting model, like fucking up the economy in 2014. <laughs> so that kind of thing is an issue, right? So we think that it's better to have central banks that are able to like do this um, within a nation that do like domestic investment, F like foreign direct investment, money supply, demand, purchasing power, that kind of thing, because it has that information. It's unique and it's able to do that, right? But recognize again that these countries are largely unique or corrupt oligarchs, right? So it's protected time, um, like corrupt oligarchs. And what does that look like? So we've seen time and time again, right, with like oligarchs and this kind of thing, that the kind of economic disparities that happen when there is issues with money end up falling on the people. And we said this house is the interest of the people in these nations, right? So when you have economic sanctions, when you have barriers to being able to access Russia, which has kind of been the regional backbone for these countries, and then the other countries involved with like Russia and allied Russia, they're accountable to Russia, ending up here too, right? Um, if you harm this relationship, if you end up losing that comparative advantage, who is harmed here? Economic sanctions and lesser money in the country means a lower GDP, people starving, people dying, people not having jobs and not having food, and we're not getting that from any other country in the region because we do not sustain ourselves, we cannot sustain ourselves, we do not have the means to do that, and we don't get that by putting a bunch of corrupt dictators together and saying that this will be fine and help. I thank the speaker for those remarks, and I invite the member of government to open up the back of this debate. Here, here. here. Side opposition has provided myriad versions of the same hegemonic horror story in which there is this world centered around a counterfactual that Russia is, yes, the big bad guy, and the Central Asian Union will make Russia angry, therefore, we not, uh, not do this for one primary reason, we will make Russia angry. Here is what it fails to understand that the, that the majority of modern economic, that the majority of modern foreign policy statecraft and geopolitics is largely economic. They are right to say that sanctions will probably be the only barrier that Russia takes up against. Right now, taking up arms in this area is not in Russia's best interest. The majority of take has happened on an economic policy level. Sanctions are why they siphon that. The counterfactual that they do not realize that there are other economic areas in the region and across the globe, specifically when one becomes a global union. They don't take into account the larger aspects of global geopolitics. That's just a basic reputation of what to support them about it. We hear this argument again about Russia and the aggression. Here's why this is just not going to play the way they think it is. Right now in the quo, Russia does actively trade with the nation with these four different nations. It makes no sense to say that after this union they would, they would stop trading. They would likely just trade in a different way. Now I'm part of the global union trading as a, as a region. They're currently trading with nations. All they're practically doing is changing their currency and their name. We'll show you why that garners them lots of geopolitical clout that will help them create actual policy changes. 
Okay, we also have to take into we also forget to take into account the West. What does it translate now to be a marked enemy of Russia that has a global that has a global political face? It means the West is now on your side in a way that they weren't before. It means namely that Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron of France and Charles stepped down are the people who are going to be backing the region because they yeah. realize that because the status that NATO is in and recent actions taken by Putin and the Ukraine and Crimea means that new geopolitical actors that have new land bases that have new land bases and new ports are directly in the interest of the West, which means that even if Russia says I will take a hardline stance against you, don't you'll come up for that with your allies that are also directly against Russia. Also we can note that right now there were um really there were really, really interesting reasons to believe that with Russia's new pick towards Saudi Arabia and light of Iran, that we can actually gain Russia's side and this advantage as well. But we'll get to that later. Second, we hear this argument that they have low military power as a state. You'll probably hear something from back opposition about how, like, these states have low monetary power and low economies. They, 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 their best job is to like pander. And what's in their best interest is just to kind of keep doing what they're doing. That's not the case. First, hard power hegemony is not is not the paramount goal of any global union. Economic standing in the global stage is rather what the global coalitions work to exist for. Global co go global coalitions are more likely to have more economic power in the global states for several reasons. First, they have more accountability. Investors of other countries can now say these states are accountable to at least each other and therefore accountable to more in the global stage and now we can sanction four independent states than one independent state, meaning internalized pressure happens at coalitions to be accountable to economic reforms and the boundaries of, of economic investments. Similarly, now that we have combined assets, investors have more to invest on. And one sweeping package, they can invest on twice the, uh, twice the infrastructure of former countries, or at least four times as much than they could before. This also means that a common currency makes transactions for global trade much easier in this region, specifically as investors from the Middle East and the West are trying to get access to trade routes in China, specifically going to land region. So, uh, second on this reputation, regional tension created by geopolitics gains the support of the West, just cross the that support that support the world. Every time you hear, oh my god, Russia's gonna get mad, just cross the that the West will support them because yes, we're mad, Russia gets mad. Okay, on to some issues of uh, oh, Okay, so your opening government told us that China would be really, really mad about this union because they, among other things, don't like Muslim people. So why are they also going to allow this union to become the trade route that gets into their country? Okay. Right now, it's important to understand what Xi Jinping is doing under new, new economic reforms. Foreign policy is not right now on the mind of the Chinese uh, executive. What's more happening, unless it involves the South China Sea, which a coalition could help their interests with actually, they're not going to be concerned about economic graphs that give them actually more buy into their own trade unions in the first place. The Asia Infrastructure, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank has been looking for a partner in this region since 2011 when they hoped that the Arab uprisings would change regional actors in the area of economic investment. China has no reason to begin the policy, especially if things open up trade for their own country. Okay, on to some positive matter. First, the importance of global unions cannot be understated specifically with the people in the region. What has been happening recently? Populism and nationalism has been on the rise across the West and the global South. We can see in the status quo, the feat of the 20th century to create global unions and in international liberal order is slowly dying in areas where it's deemed most important. Think Brexit. Think austerity measures taken up in the EU by Angela Merkel and Germany. Think the Brexit transition to a drachma rather than the euro. Think about Hungary's recent opposition party. Think about the Italian Basta party. Think about recent ties with Venezuela and Maduro. We can see that there is nationalism on rise and global institutions are falling drastically. Why is it then in the best interest of the Central Asian states to create their own global union to revitalize what it means to be a global liberal democracy, or at least a global liberal Western power standing in the East? First, the, first we can see that this creates more advantages for regional peace. Why? Because global unions are statistically more apt to have regional peace in areas because they can work together for coalitions to use different geographic land areas to have different areas for scouting and for trade. Whenever you can create yourself as an economic power, you're more likely to have peace with hegemons in your area. Secondly, whenever we create global unions, we're more likely to see increased social reforms in these nation states that are part of the coalition. Why is that the case? Because now that global unions have their own coalition, they have their own cabinets, their own executives. The EU has its own European Union Council in addition to the parliament that happen with the EU state. Whenever nation states can tie on to global unions, it frees up their parliament, it frees up their dictators, it frees up their different systems of governing to focus on social reform and domestic policy over international global affairs, specifically because now there's a separate coalition to dedicate resources towards those types of ideas. Increased social reforms in these countries because the time has now been free up means that not only do, does the area get a direct economic trade route to be to actor with other nations, but it also now has room to prioritize social reform 
to go along with an increased influx of economic capital that the area necessarily gets. We've demonstrated to you why Russia is not going to be a big player. And even if they are, all you do is buy our advantage of gaining more support in the rest, cross apply that as if something like increased trade. On China, we've shown you why it's actually in China's interest to have these increased trade routes through leg access, because the Middle East has been wanting to establish these things for quite a while now, and it becomes difficult as foreign currencies make it harder to do transactions. This also increases investments that people will make in the area, because these like common currencies collective assets and national responsibility mean that investors are making smart investment choices in the region. We can see that all of these things demonstrate to us that we are pe that we are going to be more progressive support in the area that Tom have said, but also biting back against any of the harms that were tried to be fictitiously laid out to you by opening opposition. We have shown you how the likely bait that you will hear from back half about how they have a weak economy and a weak military, they put it to just like pander their best guns to whoever is on them, is not going to actually help them in the long run the way this group. government is right that this is far more an interesting story than just about whether or not Russia is going to get angry and invade Kazakhstan. The far more interesting story is about how Russia gets angry and the regional partners surrounding them that are necessary and their loyalty is necessary to secure a major axis against the West are going to get drawn into this conflict, stationed troops, and sanctioned them to the point where this unit is destined to fail in the long term. Before we do that, let's talk accurately characterize these sorts of states and why this is necessarily going to be so dangerous. Uh, of course, all rebuttal will be integrated. So, let's characterize these states in relation to the region that they exist in, right? Back half, yes, they are new and poor states, but that matters, right? These are states that recently became independent after the dissolution of the USSR in 1991. That means that they have an inability to diversify because most of them are relying on petroleum products. Key point here, the, re the way that they get those is by a monopoly pop pipeline in Russia and in St. Petersburg that they need to make sure that they can fund their state, gov their state governments. They are homogenous industries, which means that even if they collectivize together and trade with each other, they're still not providing each other much comparative advantage, which is why they're going to have to go to the EU to secure trade agreements. We're going to tell you why that's going to piss off China and destroy their economic viability. They are also, yes, weak militaries. They are corrupt, which means they have no cooperation and unity in the same way that the Peshmerga is corrupt and has no disunity and couldn't fight back against the insurgency of Iran and the Iraqi government once they tried to invade their state. They are poorly funded. They are also heavily dependent on other individuals within the region, right? So not just the Russian pipeline, but billions of dollars in investment from, yes, China through the Belt and Road Initiative that they are relying on in order to make sure that any of this union could ever come together in the very first place. It is also key and crucial here for later in the extension, security cooperation with the Russian government to fight Islamic insurgencies within those countries that are destabilized the region and stopping them from being able to build those pipelines to diversify their economy in the very first place. Like literally extremist like extremist positions in Uzbekistan destroyed the natural gas the natural gas pipeline that they were going to use to cooperate with Turkey to make sure they could diversify their economy. Here, those here. sorts of things exist. They need Russia in order to do that. It is also as opening opposition accurately characterized a buffer against the West, which Russia sees as really, really important. Why is that important? What's going to happen? As closing government um, correctly but fatally identifies, this will result in a pivot to the European Union, right? Why is that? The United States has no interest with trading in these regions, right? You can't even identify them on a map, right? That they have the surrounding nations and trade, places like Iran and Turkey and China, are unwilling to trade with them. We got a response, a preemptive response from the closing position, which said, ah, well, China really needs the Belt and Road Initiative project. They want to diversify their economy, the AIB stuff. All of that is true. But the problem is that China is reliant on the loyalty for Russia and places around the region in order to secure an access against the West. What happens when you start forming trade relations with the EU, we think they're mutually exclusive with China because the things that you need to do is economically diversify with the European Union. You need to do things like station troops and bases to protect the military assets in the largest union in this area that has ever been created. It is making sure that the free movement of people from the EU to these locations actually happens, which means you've got European citizens living in these areas and pushing against the buffer that Russia has historically had with the with the West, which they want to destroy, see the invasion of South Ossetia and see the invasion of Crimea, see the opposition to the uh, in integration of Montenegro into NATO, that is why they're not going to like this, especially when the European Union gets involved. We get a preemptive response again that says, oh, well, this is going to hold the governments accountable. Very interesting, because right after that, they tell us how we're getting authoritarian, nationalist, gov populist governments into office that don't care about democratic certainty, which means that they're not going to hold these accountable, which means you're going to have very poor, very corrupt, very inoperable states that 
that are going to rely on the cooperation of the regions around them to be economically viable. You destroy the political capital they have to be economically viable with them as soon as you piss, it, piss everyone in the region off. What happens then? Russian backlash, right? This is not a something to swipe away in the debate because you're, some, you're frustrated that these are all the typical arguments in an IR round. Yes, they are. That's because it's important. That's because Russia has literally invaded three different states in order to push, push against the axis of the West. They put little green men into places like Ukraine and use democratic mechanisms of hybrid warfare to destabilize the governments and take down the regions, which made everyone poor, which took away their jobs, and took away people's ability to put food on the table. That matters in this debate. But it also means that you can sanction those governments as soon as you realize they're forming a union to push back against you and ally with the West, which destroys your ability to influence the region, right? Russia cuts off the pipeline, which means you don't have electricity in these states in regions that are heavily dependent on them to even operate their businesses in the first place. You cut off security cooperation and military assets that fight against Islamic extremism, which take over rural states and destroy the ability of the central government to have influence over them in the first place. You destroy China's ability to engage in the Belt and Road Initiative, which means billions of dollars leaving the region in capital flight, which again destroys their ability to become economically viable, right? That This is also important because as soon as that happens, the European Union is very likely to retaliate against this sort of movement, right? They need to protect their economic assets. You told me in CG that they're going to rely heavily on them in order for this trade agreement to work. What does that mean? At the very, very, very least, they sanction places like Iran, Turkey, uh, they, they, they sanction states like Russia, they move troops in to protect their assets, which means countries in the region around them begin to retaliate because now the asset that Russia has protected in the region is starting to be defended by the EU. It means places like Turkey, pieces like Iran, send troops in to defend those pipelines and those economic assets. Okay. Iran literally did so in Kurdistan when the, like, like the United States started supporting independent Kurdistan to take over the oil pipeline that would have made sure that their government could have actually been functional after the independent vote. Iran sent in troops to try and defend those assets, which sparked a larger conflict within that region. It also mobilizes extremist groups once they see other states that they don't like getting involved in the conflict in the region that they currently control. That's the reason the Syrian war is so dangerous, because all of these militant groups are fighting against multiple different actors in the West, because everyone's trying to do the same thing, but no one agrees on the terms of engagement. Before I move on, I'll go ahead and give opening one more chance. We both agree on corruption, homogenous economies, and poverty. All these are issues. Remember, they advocate for doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, nothing is better than you, which destabilizes the economy surrounded by by sanctioning these states and getting military involvement into these regions, which destroys the ability for these countries to uh, A, fight Islamic extremism in these areas, and B, maintain stability in government because you have militaries who are now doing cross-border conflict to try and protect military assets, right? These countries cannot defend themselves because you've taken away the money from the Belt and Road Initiative project, and you've destroyed their ability to fight against three different fronts. That is Iran, that is China, that is Turkey, and that is Islamic extremism. Uh, Islamic extremism, extremism, which is now actually forefront, so put that under your flow as well. Why is this important for the debate, right? We think we easily take OG out of the debate. At best, economic development is canceled by the decreased investment in military conflict, which means that you get net positive, like a net zero sum of gain on their side of the house. But at worst, you spark a larger military conflict with the European Union, a populist, populist government that are willing to engage you on conflict on your fronts, and that means that you don't really get any of the benefits on your side of the house. We take CG out because these governments are democratic, as I told you, but also so Russia getting mad in the West supporting them doesn't equal a benefit if you start war in the region and increase the amount of conflict, right? We beat you oh, oh, because we give you more mechanisms as to why Russia is going to get angry, and we expand this debate between the bipolar relations between uh, bilateral relations between states. And talk about like at least six different actors who are going to get really mad and destroy the region's viability. And speaker for those remarks, and I invite the government to close up the government side. My heart's beating really fast because Robert got me so excited. I'm just really going to jump right in here with my three questions to crystallize this debate for you all. So for question one, should fear of Russia stop us from forming the CAU? This is the top half debate we concluded is a no. Question two, what Robert just brought you, would this lead to somehow massive land wars and an incredible conflict and total disaster? No, also no. Okay, then the question three, the only one to which the answer will be yes. Does the union of the CAU provide unique benefits? Yes, that's what Nix tells you, that's why we win this debate. I threw my, all my papers on the ground like an idiot. So, okay, question one. Should fear of Russia stop us from forming the CAU? No. So, kind of 
what I really want to ooh, I forgot something. What I really want to bring to you in this debate is that one key piece of reputation that I think actually helps beat both of the opposition teams and really crystallizes what the real stakeholders in this round are. So both of the opposition teams seem to characterize the relationship with Russia and these countries as positive for these nations because they say they supply them their power, they supply them their GDP. What Nick and I would say to you and what Nick tells you in his reputation is that that relationship is inherently negative for these countries and they ought to take the risk of breaking out of that relationship if they can, right? So it is not like these countries' economies are bad because they have no resources or because they are bad at managing these resources. No, they are just as capable as any other country in the global economy. The reason isn't that they are inherently weak. The reason is that they live under the coercion and manipulation of Russia. This coercion is purposeful. It is purposeful that they have weak economies. It is purposeful that Russia gives them just barely what they need to scratch by so that they will always be dependent to Russia in terms of economics, in terms of global politics, in terms of geopolitics. This is Nick's entire unique point that he gives you at the top of his speech for reputation. We think this basically takes out a lot of the benefits that the opposition team says these countries are supposedly getting without forming the CAU. Now, that's kind of the crystallization in terms of reputation for the kind of opposition bench in top half and what they give you. But now going through some more specific points and pointing out a few things that our opening government did, we think, well. So first, what we think opening government does well, they do well to point out that the key stakeholder in this debate is the people living in these nations. It is the people who are affected on the ground when we, ha when we see these policies. We think that Nick actually ends up winning this argument, though, when he talks about all of the benefits that economic... Uh, unions can bring that are unique to economic unions that do not exist outside of this nation that these citizens wouldn't be end up feeling. We also think that when the opening government starts off the point that Nick makes about how we can now get agreements with companies because you can engage with them on a regional basis rather than a country to country basis. We think this is something that the nations in the CAU would do with things like the oil resources which they have. It is much easier for people to be taken seriously in economic relations when you have that collective bargaining agreement. So we kind of show you why we finish off the arguments that our top half starts, the valuable arguments. So doing a little bit more into opening opposition, because I think once we beat opening opposition's arguments, the closing opposition ends up falling with them since they're structured off the same principles, right? So to beat opening opposition's arguments a little further, first of all, this damaging relationships with Russia, right? So like I said, this economic help is a way to coerce and control. By joining together in a union, they can collectively bargain with Russia without being under their thumb, right? So we think that there's several scenarios here, right? Like one is the like absolute extreme scenario, Russia cuts off the oil pipeline disaster and suits. We think that more than likely, there will be, Russia will want to renegotiate those trade terms so they can still remain on top. This gives them the agency to do that rather than being isolated and alone and under the control of Russia, who is, yes, much more powerful than them, they'll be able to collectively bargain. This is what, something they don't have when they don't have a common currency, when they don't have unity in terms of what they would like to see out of collective bargaining agreements. So, and then they, we talk about how Russia will see this as an attack inherently. Nick and I say, like, mm, maybe they will, probably they will. But here's the key, right? It's like, it's not mutually exclusive that, like, Russia will see this as an attack and they will and so they won't want to trade with them. We think that possibilities exist along a spectrum. So why let this fear keep you barred from the global economy and limit your autonomous development, right? The risk of creating the CAU is worth it rather than remaining a shell of a proxy state. If they fail, Nick and I think the likelihood is that things will revert to the status quo rather than getting worse, which is what opposition wants you to believe. We don't think they have the link work to show you that. It will necessarily happen. We think the risk is worth the potential benefits. We think if the CAU fails, things will go back to how they were before, not revert to some worst scenario yes look russia didn't renegotiate a trade deal with ukraine and georgia when they tried to break away from their, from their control they invaded those states destabilized them and cut their gdp in half overnight why will that not happen here especially when china russia and turkey get involved because they won't like the eu in the region like engage with that analysis like seven minutes of it okay so listen the reason the difference between ukraine and georgia is the cau it's not one country to one country it is several countries to one country it is an economic union to one country it is completely different terms than what we have seen before i also think the ukraine part flows to our side and i wrote something down about that somewhere basically we think the ukraine part flows to our side because it shows that these countries are under the coercion of russia and unless they have some union to back them they are going to fail this is like the eu was ukraine wasn't part of the eu so they didn't have no obligation to defend them and help them so basically 
on to Robert's analysis because he's right. As per usual, he did an excellent job. But however, we think that he is wrong, and this is why, right? The characteristic of these, the characterization of these states is inherently incorrect. Nick explains why it is a collective good and it's not really independent. Okay, and so we also think that like they engage with the worst case. Their analysis seems to be the worst case scenario. Nick and I engage on all cases on the spectrum of everything. We think even if this war breaks out and the very worst happens, then at least they tried and at least they were able to try get out of those chains and the pattern that they have been in for the rest of time. They also explain like these are recently independent states and they've like don't have the structures that many other nations have. They will never have those structures. That is by design that they do not have those structures. The only way they can get them is to do something different, to do something new. So what does Nick uniquely tell you that wins this debate? We think he absolutely brings it home, right? So first he tells you that being an enemy to Russia makes the West automatically on your side. We think this is probably a good thing, especially if what Robert describes happens, because then there will be NATO protections. There will be someone also collectively fighting back for this group of nations. He also tells you unique benefits of economic unions that these countries have no access to without them that end up impacting the people on the ground level in those countries, right? He tells you that they are seen as more accountable, that they are more um, appealing to investors, that the common currency makes transactions easier also for China. We think this coalition will give access to China and so they would actually end up liking this coalition because it helps them with their goals, right? And then Nick tells you the importance of global unions. He says that when populism and nationalism are on the rise, we need to revitalize this idea of global power. We need to revitalize it as a positive thing. And when these countries are highlighted on the global stage and seen as legitimate actors without coercion, we think that's their only chance to do that. Thank you. I thank the speaker for those remarks, and I invite the opposition whip to close up the debate. Here, here. So opening opposition told you why it's really not smart to piss off what has historically been your only economic ally. What Robert told you to extend off that is it's really not smart to piss off what's historically your only economic ally, specifically when that economic ally has a monopoly over the energy in your region and also has strong hegemonic power over all of the other countries in, your, in that region as well, right? One of the government teams, I can't remember, characterized the, this, this region as being surrounded by a pack of wolves, right? When you're surrounded by a pack of wolves, the worst thing to do is attack the alpha and make sure all the other wolves are going to be pissed you as well. That's what Robert told you in extension. That's why it's the most important things in this round. Two things I want to talk about in this whip speech to characterize. First thing I want to talk about why this is bad for these countries externally, that is nations acting upon them and their interactions with other nations, and then talk about why it's bad internally, and I think that's going to encompass all of the argumentation that we heard in the round. Okay, externally. A lot of this debate is centered around the idea brought up primarily by the leader of opposition that these countries are highly re heavily re reliant on Russia economically and this union would piss off Russia, right? Opening government, closing government, give kind of a salient point. Just like, why is this the case, right? Unions can still trade with Russia, right? So CAU, as a union, could still technically create take trade deals with Russia. Opening opposition gives you two reasons why this pisses them off. One, because Russia has cultural investment and dominance in the area. And secondly, because Russia does not like having less economic leverage and they'll have less economic leverage when these countries start trading with each other. No, thank you, right? Robert, I think, gives you a more salient point, right? It's not just about cultural investment and dominance in the area that came from the USSR. It's that Russia uses this region as a buffer to, a, to the West, Here. and Russia uses this region as an extension of its mon a monopoly, a mon a monopoly of oil power that extends to places like Turkey, places like Iran, and places like China, right? So this is these countries are about Russia's extension of power and protection of power from other nations, right? That's why it's particularly funny when the closing government comes up here and their extension is like, look, we know we're, they're going to piss off Russia, but at least this union can go and trade and shift to economic relationships with the European Union instead, right? They can go start trading with Europe and it'll be fine. I agree with the member of government's analysis that the EU is far more likely to trade with these nations once they've created a currency union because that makes investments far more safe, right? But here's the case. When Robert tells you in extension that these countries have been seen by Russia as the buffer to the West, and now these countries get together in a union and specifically start trading with the West, like the member of government told you, this is how it extends from Russia just being pissed off to Russia seeing the CAU as a legitimate military and economic threat within their region. That's how we get all the bad things that they talk about, right? Okay, how does Russia respond? Opening opposition gave you two large pieces of analysis, right? That is, they change worker visas and, uh, you know, they sanction and increase military presence, kind of heighten tensions and things like that. 
I think Robert extends upon this significantly, right? First piece of context he gives you is that these are oil-reliant economies that depend upon a monopolized Russian pop pipeline, right? That is to say, because these are growing economies, they are reliant upon natural fuel resources in order to get their economies running, and they get all of those natural fuel resources, fuel resources from one place, and that is Russia that has established pipelines in these nations, right? So what does that mean? That means, one, Russia can totally cut them off and make sure that their economic growth is slowed and perhaps not even able to get off the foot in the long run, right? But what does that mean even further? That means we think that the EU relationships that closing government tells us long-term fail, right? Because the EU might invest in there for a while, but when they recognize this economy is going nowhere because they have no energy resources to capitalize upon, then the EU probably eventually pulls out a couple of years down the road, right? But then closing government gives us another response. It's like, look, okay, Russia fails, EU fails, at least they can put, exist as part of China's One Belt, One Road initiative and be part of the, and, and use that trade leverage because of their uh, geopolitical dominance in that area, right? Two responses. One, like Robert told, uh, three responses actually. One, like Robert told you, China is far less likely to use the CAU as part of its One Belt, One Road initiative when they also recognize that doing so will piss off Russia, which is a far bigger ally to them in okay. creating that initiative in the first place, right? They recognize that they're reliant upon Russia not only for trade for energy resources, but establishing this One Belt, One Road in the first place. So why would they start trading with a group that's going to significantly piss off Russia in that region? It's going to be counterproductive for China to do so, right? The second is, is this kind of contradictory with the government bench, right? Okay. Because opening government tells us that China specifically Likes to specifically likes to create trade deals with countries that they have massive leverage over, right? We don't think that they're going to have as much leverage over the CAU, and therefore they're not going to want to trade as much with it, right? Thirdly, we think the One Belt, One Road initiative was intended to connect trade with places like Iran and Turkey, right? Robert told you why Iran and Turkey are also dependent upon this energy monopoly that exists with Russia, and they're not likely to want to use the CAU for, for this reason when they, are, uh, they specifically piss off Russia, right? It's not just about pissing off Russia and taking away worker visas like uh, opening opposition told you. Closing opposition told you why this literally takes out any weight or leverage that they had in the region in the first place. I'll take closing. Okay, look, original power in the West with backing of sorry, sorry, original power in the area back in the West means that Saudi Arabia now has a new ally against Iraq. Even if all this is correct, this means that Saudis at least have the support backing of the CAU and all of the economic reforms from oil that MBS wants to bring China. into China. Okay, yeah, so Saudi Arabia now has a new, uh, a new military ally against Iran. This military ally, one, doesn't actually have a strong military. Two, doesn't have a strong economy because all of their energy resources have been taken away from the energy monopoly that exists in their country. Three, have large Islamic insurgencies that exist in their countries that are no longer being destroyed because they do not have the military allyship with Russia that they had in the first place. Another piece of extension that Robert gave you. Okay, let's move on to that then. Let's talk about internal, right? So they've cut off any ability for them to exist in the region that they exist in because their one ally was also a hegemon in that region, but why do they ruin themselves internally? Like, first I want to respond to some of the more mundane government arguments I hear here, right? The first one is that cut these countries can hold each other accountable. Opening opposition response to this is largely good. Why do oligarchs want to hold other oligarchs accountable? They just want to be more dictatorship oligarchs that make themselves more money and never spread the money forward, right? That's why I think it's especially funny when closing government tells us, like, now that they have more time because they're doing less political deals with other people, they're going to have more time to do things like social reforms, right? Why do four or oligarchical governments that have very little, little political capital already for the people suddenly come together and then start talking about social reforms. They give us no incentive analysis about why that happened, right? But what Robert gives you uniquely in extension, extension is how insurgents groups have existed in these regions for a long time, and because of their weak police forces and weak militaries, they haven't had the ability to control those forces anyway, right? So what have they depended upon to create any kind of stability in their economy? They've depended upon Russia bringing in police forces here, here. to protect their economic interests in that region. Right? What happens when they piss off Russia is Russia no longer wants those police forces in that region and no longer helps them with those insurgencies. So not only are they able to cut them off from their energy monopoly, they're also able to cut them off from the basic protections that lead here, to here. institutions being able to grow in the first place. Even if they ever get any investment from a place like the EU, that's only going to piss off the region more and it's never going to take hold when the basic actors around them never want to trade with them anymore because they pissed off their biggest and most substantial ally in the region. Very proud of you. Here, here.